great to have you with us here today on City Life. Now, we hope to have programming back to normal tomorrow where all guests and crew can get to the studio safely. Now, these are our last days on Māori television, so we thank them very much for their support since we got back up and running at the beginning of May and we'll miss being on their channel. Now, I do have an announcement from the Ministry of Health. In this cold snap, it's important to keep warm and stay indoors. Look after yourself and look after others. Check up on those people who are a bit older and pop the kettle on for them. Pop in and check up on your neighbours, give older relatives a call to see how they're going. If you know of someone who just cannot cope, please don't be afraid to ask for help. Pick up the phone 0800 777 0800 777 Now today on the programme we do have a couple of studios and guests but the second half of this programme is with an interview that I had with Jill Darcy last week from the Complex Family Foundation um, but first we've got Sarah from Chumley. City Life, and I'd like to welcome Sarah from Chumley. Good to have you here. Thank you. Good now to see you. Tell me about Chumley. Chumley is a children's charity that's been around for about 85 years, and it's the only one of its kind actually in New Zealand. Um, and that's really because it offers residential care for children, but on a short for a short period of time. So people often think residential care means um, they're in there for a really long time, you know, yeah. lock the lock the door, throw away the key, and that's not at all how um, Chumley operates. So we're always trying to get people to understand that because mm. th they often think Chumley's a bit like an orphanage or a place where naughty children go and it mm. certainly isn't. It's actually quite cutting edge in regard to what it does and, and the service it offers children and families. Yep. Now it's one of its kind in New Zealand mm. and also, well it's the only one in New Zealand yep. and one of very few internationally. Exactly, which is really unusual and there's a couple of things there like Chumley is not captured by the government so Chumley is um, primarily community funded. So if you think about all the donations that people would give us or different trusts, things like that. So 80% um, of our funding comes from the community. So what it means is we don't have to operate in the same way um, that, say, a government um, organisation that's caring for children would. Mm -hmm. And then with that, we've got 85 years of history of this amazing place that's um, looked after over 25,000 children, and, you know, and pr primarily Cantabrians. And so I go out and meet these people sometimes in the course of you know, trying to get supporters for Chumley, yeah, yeah. and um, it's an incredible thing, yeah. Now you say you've had over 25,000 mm. young people through the, the children's, is it a home? You don't call it a home? We don't call it a children's home, and the reason is it's a negative connotation that yeah. makes people think of an orphanage, and it's yeah. an old-fashioned word, and, and it's not about valuing children when you mm. talk about a children's home. Mm. Um, they come for short periods of time, then they go home, okay. and they develop strategies at Chumley to handle the home environment better. Mm. So yeah, it's not a children's home. <laughs> So what do you call it? Um, we call it Chumley. Chumley? Yeah, Chumley. Okay. And um, sometimes we do refer to the home as, I mean, the actual house part of it as a house. Oh, okay. it is a house. Yeah. <laughs> but we certainly wouldn't say Chumley Children's Home. Or we right. say charity, Chumley Children's Charity. Okay. Yeah. So you've had 25,000 young, pe young people go through there. Mm -hmm. I mean, the success stories that have that have come out of, mm -hmm. out of it, do you, I mean... Is it a privilege of yours to, to know some of those stories? Yeah, and the, the, the worst thing is I'm told them by people who don't necessarily want to retell the story publicly, right. you know, because it's a very painful um, memory. It can be, not because of what their experience at Chumley was like, mm. but what was happening in their life at the time. Mm. Like some incredible like um, people you meet, business people who are very successful, who stayed there yeah mm. it's incredible mm. and do they like to say do they are they do they willingly say that they went to Chumley? they tell you you get to a certain point and you can almost feel there's about something about to happen or be wow. said yeah it's really really unusual it's honestly happened so many times it's amazing like a guy who owns about 19 different businesses in Christchurch you know he actually went through oh sorry his children went through and wow. you'd never know Never even known. He had just had a difficult time in his marriage where the children were under stress and they needed to get out of that environment. Mm. It's incredible. Mm. Now, where do you get your sponsorship from, your support? Yeah, from so many different places. So we get, we're lucky enough to have the support of CTV. So we have different relationships like that, mm. which is really good. And um, we have corporate sponsors mm. like Price Waterhouse Coopers, the Fendleton Eye Clinic. You know, all these different people, even like Littleton Engineering and Littleton Port Company. Mm. And then you've got like um, an individual. You know, someone who might operate. Um, 
out of New Zealand, you know, who has this attachment or this caring or this connection to Chumley. So, and, and Ma and Pa sitting at home, a little yeah. child who wants to help, you know, mm. and wants to make a difference to other children. Mm. It's just really, really incredible. Yeah. And I remember a couple of years ago when I used to work in radio, um, I organised um, a big morning tea. Yeah, yeah. that's coming up. Canada's biggest morning tea. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That was in Latimer Square, and I got everybody from uh, the radio network and everybody from AMI, and we all from, you know, the Latimer Square area, we all had a massive uh, morning tea in the um, Latimer Square, I'd raised some money for Chumley. So yeah. Good that, to hear it's coming you, up. You, that's you <laughs> doing the raising. And it was about 20 grand a year we get out of that wow. event. It's massive. Of. The community cool. is incredible in Canterbury. Yeah. yeah. All right. So, what are some of the um, fundraising ideas that are coming up? So, coming up is um, Canterbury's biggest morning tea. Yeah. So, this will be the eleventh year, wow. and that is on the fifteenth of August. So, we'll send out registration packs and things like that for that, and that's sponsored by Price Waterhouse Coopers. Um, and we've got a care magazine, so our direct mail is coming out in August as well at the end. And then we've got a ball, um, the Rotary Ball, the um, Christchurch City Rotary Ball. Yeah. And that's going to be at the Wigram um, Air Force Museum. And it's on the 3rd of September and tables are 2000 um, or $200 per head for a table of 10. It's going to be wow. brilliant. So it won't be all themed and um, it's not going to be over the top. We want to do it more about the cause this time, which is about really raising money for the kids. So... Oh, it's all good. Very fun. I so know. it's going to be a massive ball. So everyone's going to be ball gowns. Beautiful ball gowns, dressed up. But it'll, it, will be, it will will not have a big theme. So it will just be a stunning room, beautiful, just a lovely night. Ah, oh, yeah. man, it's, that's not oh, You can cool. come. We'll have I know, it. Yeah. September the 3rd. Yeah. Oh. What good. am I going to wear? I, I know. For the children. For the children. For the children yeah. <laughs> so where can we find out more about Chumley? Um, our website, so www.chumley.org.nz. Um, and Chumley is spelt differently than it's pronounced, yeah. so it's a little bit unusual. What yet? What's... Mm. It's, it's what? actually Old English, that's Queen's oh. English, Chumley, and it comes from Lord Chumley overseas, and there's still a family there, and they have like um, the pageant of power, kind of the massive car races and stuff, and they do heaps of fundraising over there in England, and his family actually is, yeah, the people that set Chumley up in the beginning. How cool is that? I know. All right, I'm saving September the 3rd. Please do, it'll I'm be lovely to see you. Full there. dress. Okay, yeah. Sarah, good to have you on the programme. Thank you. Back with City Life and seeing as it's the school holidays, I think it's a great time to talk about teen style and how to get around the pitfalls. Now, Stephanie, I think I was a bit of an awkward teen, so could you actually have helped me back then? Oh, I'm sure I could have, and I'm sure you were not an awkward teen. I'm I think sure you were was. beautiful. <laughs> but we all have that time in our teens where we feel awkward because our bodies grow really quickly. We grow from being a child to being an adult. We've got to manage ourselves, you know, really transitioning our style from childhood into that sort of teen style mm. as well. All right, so if you are a teenager, how can you sort of dress yourself for, for less, I suppose? OK, well, the thing with teens is you're growing really quickly, often outwards and upwards. So it's really important that you don't waste a lot of money on really expensive clothes. And it's a good gamut of inexpensive shops that are targeted to the teen market. Okay. For example, Glassons would be one of my favourites. You've got Supre, Dotty, Lippy, um, all of those shops that are, you know, dressing for less that are fantastic. For Evan News, another new one on the scene. Mm, Great okay. teen shop as well. All right. So how can we dress the teenagers without, I guess, causing any fights? Okay. <laughs> so the thing to do is to educate them on what actually looks good. So there's two things that teens can tend, or three things teens can, mistakes teen, teenage girls can tend to make. One is their makeup's too heavy. So they put on lots of makeup, maybe because their skin isn't as good as it was as a child, they've got a few pimples, and they look like they've got a mask on. So get a makeup lesson and just have a very thin, you don't even really need a lot of foundation as a teen, just make mascara and lipstick, so that's the first mistake. The second is they can get their boobs out. Now, the thing to remember about this mm -hmm. is it's not just the teenage boys looking, it's their father's friends as well. So I think that's a really good thing to educate them on, that it's not all men will look. Mm. And the third is also wearing clothes that are too small. So you see that with the muffin top or the tight jeans, things that don't necessarily suit their figure, mm -hmm. so things that are too small. All right. And boys have the trousers hanging down too low with their bums hanging out the top. But isn't it the style? Well, it's the style is definitely baggy. Definitely baggy, but there comes a point where baggy to the point of are those trousers going to stay up or mm. how much of the underwear can I see? <laughs> <laughs> it comes a negotiation. So just educating them on the fact, still look trendy, mm -hmm. but 
but decency mm -hmm. is important as well. All right, what can teens get away with? Okay, well they have got less wrinkles than us <laughs> and generally their bodies are better too so they haven't had all of the um, weathering that we've had or the babies or whatever else, else it is that's made our bodies not as good as they were. So they can get away with the mini skirts, they can get away with clothes that are designed, high fashion clothes are generally designed for the young. Mm -hmm. So I think all of those really good fads and fashions are for the teens. Right. Bright colours, Really? Yeah, all sorts of things like that. I mean, black, save that for your older years when you, you know, really want to. Wear things that are bright, vibrant, all those funky fad fashions are for teens. All right. Now, it is pretty cold at the moment, yeah. but spring's coming, so summer. Absolutely. What's hot for teens this spring and summer? Okay, so there's about four key things that are coming through. Lace is still really hot, and I'm seeing some great little lace dresses. In fact, I saw on a Max the other day, awesome blue number, fantastic. In fact, one of my clients bought it. She mm -hmm. was a youngish girl too. Uh, so lace is big, really acid brights. So acid brights are really fashionable. The days of wearing all black are all gone. So acid brights are very fashionable. So bright colours, mm -hmm. and on, the, on that two colour blocking. So we talked about that a few mm -hmm. weeks ago, wearing bright colours together. And also, long maxi skirts are really fashionable for teens. Mm. I think those of us who are sort of over 35 are a little bit frumpy in them, but <laughs> the teens can get away with that long sheer maxi skirt, mm, okay. just right to the ankle. Cool. So this is your blog for this week? Yes, I did it. I've written the blog. I wrote it yesterday. Okay. So it should be posted and online. You can have a little read. There's some cool, cool wee photos in there Great. as well. All right. Now, you have um, a gig I suppose, coming up. Yes, I do. So, Saturday the 6th of August, uh, Kashmir High School's raising money for some of their uh, Spanish students to go to Chile on um, a big trip. It's a very good high school, I might add. Oh. My very own high school. Oh, there you go. <laughs> we'll see you there too, Kenita. <laughs> so, they have a, we have a fantastic evening. The students who are going away are modelling some teen fashion, the first half of the show, and then two teachers are being made over in secret and we're going to reveal them on the night. Oh, really? Yes. Fun. Where can yes. we get our tickets from? OK, so you can email susie at flareimage.co.nz. That's susie at flareimage.co.nz. Or you can ring Kashmir High School for the details. OK, is it Susie? S-U-Z-Y. OK, great. Excellent. So Kashmir High School on the 6th of August. Absolutely. Great. Thank you. Stephanie, we have some mini rumbles in here today. Yes, we do. There's a few of them in my household. They've yeah. been around for a couple of weeks lately. Yeah. Yes. School holidays? Yeah. And you've all dressed yourselves today? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so Zach, Scarlett, Bryn and Poppy. Beautiful children. Now, what are you wearing today? Uh, I'm wearing an Adidas hoodie, um, a pink tilt top underneath OMM jeans. <laughs> Vans, shoes and globe socks. I think he's well into, into fashion just like you. He's of the age where he's showing a little bit more interest. <laughs> Scarlett? Well, I'm wearing um, uh, country road boots. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Some lovely pink tights. Uh, from pumpkin patch and um... Did you knit your scarf? I don't think you did, didn't you? Yeah, and I knitted this with mummy and... Aww. Mm. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> Beautiful. And Bryn? I think I'm wearing a... Um, Yellow country road top. I think it's pumpkin patch. Pumpkin <laughs> patch. I don't know. Um, yeah. And a, it's got rock star on it, and then jeans. That are just normal jeans from country road, I think. <laughs> and shoes to match. Yeah. And beautiful poppy. I love your dress with your pink boots. <laughs> Cute as. Okay, it's school holidays. What have you guys been up to? Oh uh, well, in the first week we hung around home, and I was out longboarding with my friends. Um, mainly at Gainsborough. Cool. Zach has actually got something interesting to tell you about his longboarding. Tell oh. us what, what happened. Oh, yeah. Um, a couple of, about a month ago, we made a longboard and it ended up too flexible. Oh. So we sort of left that one. Oh. And we made another one and it worked. And I was going down a hill and it snapped. <gasps> But you actually made a long board. Yeah, mm, and it man. snapped. And it snapped. Yeah. yeah so their dad, cool. their dad helped okay. them put clamps on it and bent the wood. And oh, wow. So it's a really good option for people who, you know, don't want to fork out hundreds of dollars for a new long board. This yeah. one would love that, but, yeah. you know, he's got to earn the money. Yeah. So they can actually get some plywood from Mitre 10 or Bunnings and 
get the right. wheels and put one together themselves. Nice initiative. All right, we've got some pictures actually. Was it a family holiday of the pictures that we've just yes. got to see? Yes, we've just been away. Where have we been, kids? Well, Monica. Monica. Yeah, and we went to Queenstown for just not for a night, but we went there and we just. We, um, we thought we'd gone the luge, but then we went to the movies and we saw Harry Potter. Oh, okay. And have a look. Saw Kung photos. Fu Panda. Have yes. a look. Oh, did you? Kung Fu Panda who's as this, well. Who's this, Scarlet? That's Poppy and Scarlet. I'm the one at the back and Poppy's at the front. And oh, what are you doing? Yeah. Skiing. Whereabouts? Um, Kadrona. Kadrona. Awesome. Now I think we've got some more. Uh, that's me and Brennan. We're skiing at Kadrona. I'm the one in the blue jacket. Yeah. Well, it's a blue and black jacket, and Bryn's in the green jacket. Nice one. And these guys, I have to say, I have to admit, very reluctantly, that they're actually better skiers than me now. I can't Aww. believe it. <laughs> what <laughs> happened, guys? I don't know. It's not you. The boys. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> and any more? Oh. Now, what's happening here? Do you well, we found, found a geocache. Wow. So do you want to explain what geocaching yes. is? Well, a geocache is where some people hide a box with a book inside. It's a form of orienteering, isn't it, yeah. Scarlett? Yeah, and when they find it somewhere, uh, no, you have to find it, and if you don't have an iPhone or a... Uh, a GPS, you can... A GPS on your phone, you, you can use a GPS. Oh, a normal OK, one. Zach. Can you can you add to that? Oh uh, well, it's like um, well, it's like a little box, and yep. sometimes they have little things that you can trade. Okay. For. And it's orienteering. Yeah, it's it? like it's like orienteering. Free. But and free it's, orienteering. It's like a downloadable app. Yeah. On a phone that's got an inbuilt GPS. Ah. And you're like um, and it tells you how far away they are. It gives you a description of them. Okay. It's probably one about hundred meters from here. Yeah. Oh, all really? around the world. So you can do this oh. anywhere in the world, and we, we love it. So we're off yeah. to Akaroa tonight, so we'll probably do some geocaching over there. Fun. So you just find these things. Yeah, you download the app for an iPhone, or you can go on the internet and look mm. up geocaching.com, mm. and you can download the coordinates and use a normal GPS to find them. Oh, nice one. So that's what you've been up to for the holidays yeah. as well. Yeah. Okay, and Scarlett, you've got a little note there. Who's that from? Um, my the Tooth Fairy. What does it say? Do you want to read it or shall I read it now? You can read it. Okay. So is it this from the Tooth Fairy? Yep, it's my latest Tooth Fairy note. So I just open Okay. Dear Scarlett, thank you so very much for the lovely song and fantastic poem. Did you write that to the Tooth Fairy? Because you're missing a tooth. Oh, a couple, yeah. That one. <laughs> um, you're very talented. Keep writing songs. I'm yellow with diamonds all over me. My name is Yolanda, French for violet. I've noticed you have now lost seven teeth. Because of this, you now get help. Um, wishes can only be granted by senior tooth fairies. Seven, when you've got ten teeth lost. Mm. And then there's on the back. So I will see what they can do for you, love Yolanda. Oh my gosh, what does this mean? Um, do you know? Uh, no. You'll, ha or have, you'll have to tell your mum what happens and she can fill me in next time. When I you've, will. When you've, missed, when you've lost 10 teeth and see what happens. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Zach, Scarlett, Bryn and Poppy, thank you so much for coming on the programme today and telling me what, you, what you've been up to for the holidays. Good to have you here. Thanks for having us. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay, after the break, Jill Darcy. First, Jill Darcy, the founder of the Complex Family Foundation. Welcome to City Life. Thank you very much. And thank you for coming to Christchurch for this for this episode as well. Thank you for having me. Here. You're welcome. Now, firstly, this is a topic that I'm just not um, aware of. You have to teach me all about it. My parents have been together for 35 years. I'm not married or divorced. Um, my brother and sister are both married as well. I've got right. one niece, so I just don't have that. I'm not. In that, um, mm -hmm. in that zone, I, I guess you'd say. So you'll have to teach me all about this. <laughs> <laughs> With pleasure, but it's lovely to hear that we've got these sort of traditional families that are staying together for years. It's fantastic. OK, so let's first of all talk about the foundation. Mm -hmm. Well, Complex Family, what we do is we sit inside the lounges of thousands of New Zealanders that have gone through divorce or separation. And what I do is I teach people basically how to shift their thinking from all that really negative, toxic stuff that goes on, how to heal their hurts because most of the time we've been absolutely heartbroken and devastated through what we've done 
and then we actually teach them how to co-parent. So you might not get on with your ex, but you have got children with them. So we learn how to do that constructively. Okay. Mm. So why did you start up this foundation? Thank you. Well, good question from personal experience. When I went through a divorce sort of coming up 12 years ago, I found there was a lot of really negative stuff out there, but there wasn't a lot of help on how do you do this constructively and then how do you constructively take your children on this journey that is with them for life? Because we all know once we've been through a divorce that you can outlive marriage, but you cannot outlive the bond that is created when you make babies with someone. And so we had to try and work out, wow, what do I do? And and so I looked at that sort of very deep, dark doorway called divorce and thought, right, I need to find a better way because the current way of doing it is really destructive and the stats are just awful that happens. So it was for me to sit back and think, how would I best do this for the children? And then that progressed through counselling and coaching of other parents. And so in the end, it was actually a group of people who just said to me, can you just write this down in a book? And as I started writing the book, there was so much information. Actually, my husband was the one who said, please, stop at some stage because no one wants to read 800 pages in one book so let's just cap it do the 400 pages and then we can set up a foundation where you can carry on teaching everyone so that's how it came into being so it's all from your own experience yeah and the experience of the thousands of people that I've helped okay mm. so you you have one-on-one -on -one counseling sessions with these people or is it just through your books that people sort of learn to heal there's a whole range that we do so I do seminars workshops one-on-one -on -one counseling uh, we do coaching over a course of months and through books if you can go on Online, there's video programs, there's all sorts of things. Okay, yeah. so what are the most common problems parents are facing when um, parenting with an ex? Well, there are sort of a raft of maybe a top ten, but let's just deal with three because these are the biggies that most people come to me with. And the first one, um, not surprising really in these circumstances, is communication. Let's face it, if there is a breakdown in the relationship, normally it's because of communication. So that's number one. Number two is actually about money. People are... We all want more of it, and if we can make someone else hurt by us gaining it, then that seems good strategy to get back at people. So money is a biggie. And the third is actually routines. So routines, we're talking about here of custody, who goes where, when, for how long, with who. And that is just a really complex thing to sort out as well. Okay, so communication, mm -hmm. money, mm -hmm. and routines. That's your top three. Big three. What else yeah. is in the top ten? So we'll look at things like step parents, because obviously that comes into to new relationships and how we deal with that with children, with more children possibly. Uh, we can go into things like discipline. How do you discipline in different environments? What happens if one ex is poisoning your children against the other? Uh, so the, another really big one is what do I do about double standards in each home? You know, my ex lets them get away with things that I just fundamentally disagree with. Mm. So the list can just go on. Okay. Mm. Do you find yourself writing more and more books, holding more and more seminars about these, just as you go along and you, you learn these new things? Yes, I do, and I've got another book in progress at the moment, uh, just because, yeah, there's more, more to tell, more mm. stories that need to be out there. Okay. Why is it so hard to parent post-divorce? I think the fundamental difference is when you are married, and as you've probably witnessed plenty because your family's all together, when you're married, you tend to overlook the things that aren't working, and you have this way of thinking, well, long term, it, it's okay. When you're divorced, suddenly that's reversed, and you will not overlook the things that aren't working. In fact, what you do is you overlook the things that are working. And so that's a fundamental difference that we go through. And so what we need to do, that's why we start trying to change your thinking, because you need to be able to see some of the things that are still working. Okay. Mm. Can you still be friends? I've got to ask. Can you still be friends with the person you've, you've divorced? Depends on circumstances a lot of the time. Some people are so heartbroken. They feel betrayed. They feel rejected. There's all sorts of reasons as to why marriage splits up. But you can still be in a respectful relationship. You can respect your differences. You don't have to agree. You don't even have to decide to compromise. But what you can do is you can be respectful towards the other parent of your child. Okay. Now, you are Auckland-based, yes. but you will have received, I'm going to guess, 
more calls from people in Christchurch following the earthquakes. Will that be right? You are absolutely right. Uh, we are Auckland-based, however, we do go throughout the country and we have had a lot of calls uh, post-earthquakes. Real complexities that are coming in here and raw. You know, everyone's very uh, highly emotional. We know that you're exhausted because of what you lived through. And people are sitting there with real big issues of, let's say, Dad's lost his home and he's lost his job, and now he's going to relocate to go and live with family. And one particular example that I've had recently, he's relocating to go and live in Nelson with his family. And he's been here with the children for the last six years. And now, of course, the ex-wife is going to be left with looking after the children here because she's still got a home, she's still got her job, mm. and she's not ready to move because the rest of her family's here. So very real, very raw, now the children are in a position where they're not going to be seeing their dad as much and how do you cope with that? Mm. Mm. How do you coach people through that kind of thing? Well, really we take it one step at a time as to where they're at, what their angst is. So we need to understand why there's an issue, you know, and then how can we look at it and really take it one step at a time with them. Talk about real situations, real events that they can then manage and control because so much of Christchurch is out of control, it's beyond anyone's control. Mm. And so we try and reduce that level of anger that some people are really feeling and saying, OK, these are things you can't control, mm. here's what you can. Now let's work through that. Okay, what are some of the other issues coming out of Christchurch at the moment? Money. You know, huge problems with money. People have really lost um, incomes, they've lost lifestyles, they've lost all sorts of uh, massive changes. So money is a big one that we're having to come to. Mm -hmm. um, a lot more people going on to welfare, in which case that's really affected the feeling that they've let their children down, they don't know how to handle the children's fear. Mm -hmm. A lot of children aren't sleeping well or they're withdrawing. They're not, um, they're sort of turning to their peers more than they're turning to their parents. So yeah, those sorts of issues. Okay. Mm -hmm. So you are, you are being, you do have a, a high number of calls coming from Christchurch? Yeah. yeah. And do they go onto your website? I mean, how are there other ways that people can find out about getting through these, the earthquake at the moment? Certainly our website, so complexfamily.com, that's a good way. Yeah. Um, and a lot of it has been through word of mouth, actually. All right. Okay, after the break, we're going to talk about the biggest problems for divorced parents. Great. Back soon. We're City Life and we're still with Jill Darcy from the Complex Family Foundation. Now the, the three main things we spoke about before the break, communication, routines and money. Let's look a little bit further into those things. Communication first. Great. Well communication, we always believe communication is the answer to world peace, but obviously we haven't got there. Let's talk about how we can, um, what kind of issues we have re relating to that. Normally it's quite hostile, you feel, one partner will feel quite intimidated and so there's a real bridge that we need to try and build here. And if I can give an example of a client that I've recently been working with, uh, she was divorced eight years, she's got four small children and unfortunately her husband did the fairly cliche type relationship exit off with another person. Really hard for her to handle and she was carrying the wounds of having to have the children with her most of the time. The ex had then another life. He was more interested in his other life and he wanted to see the children when it suited him. And she was really saying, how do I even talk to him about this? They'd been in and out of court four times throughout that eight year period. Those are very long, drawn out. If you know, if you know anyone who's been through it, it is not a nice ordeal for people to go through. Professionals in and out of the home, you have counsel for child where they're trying to understand where the children are at. They ask the children what they want all sorts of things that were going on. So what I did with her, after these sort of eight years full court battles, um, you can imagine that he was very intimidating and he was holding the power a lot over her. Mm. She would have that gut wrench, as you can imagine, opening an email and you see the name coming up and thinking, I'm too scared to even open it. Too scared to look at texts. Uh, she'd be quite reactive and, and withdrawn. So I spent an hour with her every week for eight weeks in our workshop and I talked through one of the keys with communication is what are you saying 
and how are you saying it and what mode of communication are you using when you're saying it. Because all too often we tend to send texts because it's easy and it's quick or we get on email and we start reciting all the facts of what we see and then we put in all this emotion of we felt let down and we feel betrayed and all these other things of what you're not doing or you know just that whole poison that's coming mm. out too often that we don't see we're doing. Mm. So we worked with the whole concept of only write short constructive factual emails mm. if you're going to email okay. and let's work with that no texting anymore just email but this is how it will be so I actually sat with her writing the emails with her in those okay. times now at the end of the eight-week program she managed to send off the positive email and I was with her when she opened up the reply email with her heart stopping mm. and it was the first positive email she'd had in eight years Wow. Yeah, so you know, these things work. Mm. And she just burst into tears because suddenly the doorway's open now to build a bridge for future. And that's what she's done. She's worked on this to now the point that they can actually sit like this across a cafe table. They still won't do it in each other's homes, mm. but they can do it across a cafe table and they can sort out some other issues. So I say be very appropriate about how you communicate, mm. but be careful on what you're saying. Mm. You know, no negative comments at all. Okay. Just ditch them. It doesn't matter. It doesn't have to be a point that you've got to prove. Mm. Let it go. Be constructive. And then be really careful what mode of communication you're using. So um, email is known for being a poor form of communication and delicate issues. Text messaging is great for brief. They're in 15 minutes. Can you make sure the kids have got their shoes? That type of thing. Mm. Nothing more. Okay. Mm. And also, I guess, with writing emails, you should write it, you should draft it, and then go back to it a bit later once you've sort of yeah. calmed down, cooled down a little bit, and put everything down on email. Would that be right? So, uh, I think actually another step, because that's really important, and that's a really good thing to say to people, even sleep on it. So write your thoughts down, but don't construct the email. Okay, write your thoughts down and then sleep. And then the next day come back and say, if I was receiving this, how would I like to have heard it? Mm. So it's really that message of treat someone else the way you would like to be treated. Okay. And even if someone screwed up, because our exes screw up, let them screw up without being berated by us, mm. you know, because we're going to screw up one day mm. and we don't want to really be told off. Mm. We would like someone to go, oh, okay, yep, screw up, never mind. It's kind of that level of respect that, yes, everyone's going to screw up in an ex relationship. Okay. Okay, so that's communication. Now let's look at routines. Routines, the biggie that people go to court for, this is one of the top reasons that people do it. And really, if I can look at um, routines, I've got a mother with uh, two children. Um, the, the, strangely enough, the father doesn't want one boy, but wants the other boy. Oh. So really hard because, you know, then how do you rule in a court scenario on what's fair and how you do this? As soon as people start going to court, there's an air of threat. You know, you can imagine getting a letter from your lawyer that says, I want you to start justifying why you deserve this child or why you don't want this child. You know, it's really hard, you know, because we've all got self-doubts. We're parents and we think, oh, we could have done that better. That's just normal parenting. And when you've got to prepare a case to go to court about whether you should have your child or whether you shouldn't, that's really intimidating for a parent. Mm. So I highly suggest that people take a step back and start thinking your routine is so important. It's important for the children to have a good experience mm. because bottom line, with a routine, the children don't remember what the routine is. They remember the atmosphere that was at handovers and whether mum and dad were fighting for 10 years mm. or whether it was debilitating with family events. So back to the mother with the two boys where one won't go and one is allowed to go. We've had to sit down and work through her anger towards that double standard mm. because actually she's the one that's been fueling the anger with the ex because it's like how dare you do that with my boys mm. understandable mm. 
justified completely, but it's not going to solve her routine problem. So then it's sitting there and saying, okay, what is a characteristic of, um, of a good routine? And I've got four things for parents to look at. So if you're in this situation, you can start looking at how you can construct a routine that's going to work for both parents, provided it falls into these four top characteristics. So the top one is, is that it's consistent. Okay. It's easy to remember in the way that you can put it into an Outlook calendar and it can just roll out for the next two years so you can book your holidays or you can plan your family events and all that so it's consistent. That's a really top one. Okay. Second point is not too long between handovers. Now sometimes we can't avoid this and especially like in Christchurch at the moment with families that one parent's having to move out, you can't avoid how long these sorts of handovers are going to be. But make sure that there are that time where they can go and see their other parent because that's really important that both parents are in the children's lives. Mm -hmm. The third one is not that people aren't chopping and changing all the time so that they're in a place long enough that they get that sense of, ha, oh, I'm home. Mm. Because it's really hard for kids, they get what I call dump and dash. And it's where they run in, they dump their bags down, they get entertained, they're hyped up, and then it's kind of like, oh come on, you're getting, you've got to go after dad. So they've got to pack up, they pick up, and off they go out the door again. And they never get that sort of sense of normality of like, oh, you know, I'm just going to put my feet up and kick back for a while. Mm. And what that does is it saps natural childhood enthusiasm to keep going and be adventurous and, and sort of a lot of initiative because they don't have that downtime. So that's a really important one. And the final one, the fourth on top of that, is flexibility. And it means that, let's say their dad rings up and says, Nana's just arrived in the country, Nana and Papa would love to see you, can I have you tonight? Instead of being, I'm sorry, but it's my night and you can't have the children, you sit there and go, of course you can. They're your nana and poppy, you haven't seen them for six months, off you go. And then it's really special to the children and it's really special to the family. And so the, that's the crux of it. You know, a routine with a bit of flexibility is fantastic. All right. Jill, um, we've got one more thing to discuss, which is uh, money, one of the biggest issues <laughs> when it comes to divorce. But we'll chat about, chat about that after the break when we also talk about children in, in a divorce. We'll be back soon. We're back with City Life and we're still with Jill Darcy with a special City Life episode of Complex Family Foundation and Complex Parenting, I suppose it, what it's it called. Is. Now what we were talking about before the break was the three biggest issues when it comes to divorce. It's mm -hmm. communication, routines and money. Let's talk about money. Money. We all want more of it and certainly as I said previously, if you can hurt your ex by getting more, then um, it's a lot of fair game. That's pretty much the philosophy that is out there. Unfortunately, I uh, take quite a different stance on this because it is so raw to most of us. I take quite a different level where I say, listen, money can be a fantastic servant, not a great master. So don't let it rule your decisions. Mm. And keep it in focus. If we can keep that children are the most important here, not money, we will solve a lot of our court issues to start with. Mm. There's two parts when it comes to money. One one is the amount that possessions, you know, your, all your assets that you divvy up when you go through a divorce and that can turn really septic even if there aren't children involved. But if there are children involved, then please keep it in mind on what is the children's home, what is their environment, what is important to them. because. As a parent, that is your responsibility of keeping that intact as much as you can. Mm. The second part of what we look at is how the money that is transferred, whether you're a payer or a payee, and that's ongoing for years. Now often in New Zealand we have the benefit and if you are on the benefit then the government takes the money from your ex and it's all fed through this way. So a lot of those arrangements are predefined but if we are not inside that structure and we're looking at people who come up with private agreements or people who have come up with court ruling agreements then there's ways that we need to look at this of keeping it in line. So one of the big issues to remember is there is no such thing as fair once you've been through a divorce because you will see it through your eyes, they see it through their eyes and we're all needing more money. Mm. So the idea is to come up with something that works. 
instead of trying to say, is it fair all the time? Because you will never get it fair for you. Mm. The part of a, let's say, the person who is paying the money, there's a little saying, pay but no play. And it really hurts them because they've got this big amount of money going out of their pay packet every week and they're not getting the privilege of actually spending time with the children. Now the one who's receiving the money is often going, yeah, but I'm the one who can't hold down the high paying job now because I've got the restriction, I need to be there to pick up my children, I need to be there to drop them off in the morning. All those restrictions that realistically come into your life, you no longer can strive for those really high paying jobs unless you've got a lot of other support around you. So there's a lot of sort of give and take, that's what I mean, it's not fair, mm. it doesn't matter. Mm. So one really good solution I've had to come up and overcome the ongoing payment issue is I've worked with a mother, she's got three children, the ex-husband has then gone on to have another two children and of course now we've got five kids, as soon as he has more children he doesn't have to pay as much legally, okay, because that's all part of the way that New Zealand structure's made up, mm -hmm. uh, but her expenses haven't gone down just because he's now got extra children. So we have to think, well, what do we do? Mm. And what we did, we actually managed to get the, her to write down how much it would cost for her having her children over a three month period. And she sent that through to her ex-husband. Now, of course, he's just sitting there going, oh, I don't think you should have spent this much on that, or I don't think, you know, and all that naturally comes mm. out. But what she managed to do was through a very common technique I've used with hundreds and well, thousands of families is set up a separate bank account. Mm -hmm. This is only for money that is paid from your ex. The money goes in there, she uses it for the children and it's to buy the school uniforms, pay for the stationery, the lost shoes, suddenly that money's there. Mm -hmm. All that type of thing, school trips, doesn't matter, in there. If there's more money, take the children on holiday with it. It doesn't matter. You know, it's all about benefiting the children. Mm. And what actually happened in this case, the ex-husband was willing to pay more than what he legally needed to because he knew the money was going directly to the children, mm. not to support her lifestyle. Okay. All right, now that we've spoken a lot about the children, yes. let's look at the effects that divorce have on children. Okay, well, once again, the stats aren't great, but let me run through them because I think it's important that people realise what the stats are. So uh, children that come from divorced families are five times more likely to be poor, they're more likely to drop out of school, they're more likely to be in trouble with the law, they're also more likely to be teen um, parents themselves and more likely to be divorced themselves. And as a result of all of this, unfortunately, they're more likely to die from um, before the average age from ill health, okay? Not great. As a parent, when you're going through that, heart-wrenching, because suddenly you feel, crap, I'm actually getting my children into a space of disadvantaged life. But that is the reality of what we're dealing with, which is why I'm so passionate about the work I do. Mm. So what we do on top of this is we look at how that happens. And what happens is children end up coping. Children to do in the coping mentality, they shut down, they withdraw, You'll see them a change radically in behaviour, where they'll, uh, if they've been quite a quiet, at home, studious kind of, kind of person, often they'll just be out raving with their friends. Mm. Okay, so dramatic changes in behaviour. Or another one is they'll zone out. And they'll just zone out to situations that are well beyond their ability to solve. Mm. And so they feel that they've lost control. And so that's what I'm trying to do here, or what I do do with all the families that we work with, is that I work one-on-one -on -one or in the workshops or in the seminars, online, whichever way people need to get the information. And I sit down and I teach you how to have your children adjust. And what adjusting means is that your children become very comfortable living in two worlds. They're comfortable moving between mum's and dad's two homes. Okay, so how do you do that? Yeah, <laughs> step by step, yeah. and we look at the issues, and I actually work at changing your thinking and healing that hurt, that broken heart, because if we can get you moving from that reactive, hurting space to a responsive, responsible space, mm. then you can actually grow a fantastic, complex family.
with City Life with a special edition with Jill Darcy from the Complex Family Foundation. Now the final segment, practical solutions and where to find help. Yes, well if you can go online to complexfamily.com you will see that we have a whole range that can actually help out parents because my aim of the foundation is to meet parents where they're at and often we need things to be very convenient at home, we've got kids running around, we need it to suit our lifestyles. Mm -hmm. So I've spent a lot of time putting together a way that it can suit the busiest of mothers and uh, the most remote places that you can go there. One of the ways that I really love to be able to help parents is actually through understanding. I love hearing from them and getting their feedback. And so I do a lot of that over the phone, help with them one-on-one. -on -one. You can go online, there's free one-on-one uh, -on -one phone calling that you can have. We do free one-on-one. Um, consultations for that. Wow. Yeah, just because I enjoy keeping in the trenches, so to speak. It's very easy when you run a foundation to become removed from it, whereas I actually enjoy doing that. So you will get me online if you'd like to. Wow. Mm -hmm. Now I've got to ask, you are, a, as you say, you're a divorced parent mm -hmm. yourself. How do you find it? How do you find it now? <laughs> um, I can say it's been a journey and it's a pleasure. It's an absolute pleasure now. I still have my moments where I will look at an email and I will think, what? And then I have to think, benefit of the doubt. I know that it probably is coming across not how it's meant to be. Mm -hmm. And so we call family, we call parenting meetings frequently. Our routine is pretty much three or four times a year, once a term, end of school holidays, get together, discuss the coming um, school and what we've got going on. I have three children, I am still operating with an ex. He is married, he has more children. Um, I am married, my um, husband doesn't have any children, so uh, we have only three that we are juggling. Okay, yeah. and how does he find coming into this family with well, three stepchildren? Yes, it was a real learning curve coming from bachelorhood. Mm. And so, you know, he was used to that whole bachelor life and then suddenly he met the pack, mm. and it's very much a pack, and he got four for the price of one, and he's really grown into the role where I've got to say he's a much loved stepfather. Mm. But he's really taken the initiative on that. He's developed his relationship with the children himself. And really, I've encouraged that all I can. Uh, there have been times that I don't agree with what he's done. He doesn't agree with what I've done. But we've agreed to support each other. And that, as a consequence, you know, we've got a fantastic relationship with the five of us in our home. So how did he find it when he first came in, though? Was it a bit scary for him being a... Daunting. Yeah. <laughs> really daunting. And he tells a fabulous story where he was just completely overwhelmed by it. And he met a very strong woman who had been on her own for quite a while. Mm. And of course I was used to being mum and dad in my home. Mm. And it's kind of like a bit of arm wrestling had to go on to find out where he fitted into it all. But he's done admirably well. Mm. Well, it's mm. good to hear you've actually done it yourself. Yes, oh, in the trenches. Yeah, that's right. Mm. Now your book, Parenting with the X Factor, tell me about that. So this really uh, came from great suggestions from other people saying to me, please write it down because I need you on tap when I need you, mm. not when I can get hold of you. Mm. And so I started writing it and I thought, how do I go about this? So in here, there are 60 of the most frequently asked questions that have been asked to me over the decade. There have been um, life examples of my own story. It won't bleed your heart, but it is a very raw story and it was real for me and when I was walking through it. And there's case studies of the many, many families that I've helped over the years and the way that we've been able to transform those. So it's a very practical how-to guide of changing that thinking. There's a whole chapter on how you heal your hurt, how you integrate step parents into the relationship. We look at money and legals and how to involve that and it's just a really practical how-to guide. All right and you've got mm. a good discount for people in Christchurch. Tell me about that. Absolutely. Look we'd love to be able to help out in Christchurch more and so certainly um, if you go online and you enter the discount code City Life, you will get 30% off everything on the website. That's mm -hmm. incredible. It's our pleasure. All right, so once again, your website? Complexfamily.com. And your phone number, do you have an 0800 number? Uh, we don't at the moment, okay. but you can call in Auckland, 376 7000. Okay, 376 7000. Thank you. Jill, thank you so much for coming on the program today. My pleasure. The special city life. It's really good to have you here. Thank Thanks you. Thanks so much.
City Life for today. Again, we'd like to thank Māori Television for having us on their channel since we relaunched at the beginning of May. We end on their channel on the 31st of July. Now, you can watch episodes of City Life at ctv.co.nz and find the big YouTube logo. Click on that. We're also on Facebook. Check us out, CTV City Life. Now, if you have any feedback for our program, you can get in contact. Kaneta at ctv.co.nz. You can call us, 3777033, or you can write to us, PO Box 11. 100 Christchurch. Thanks for watching and we'll see you tomorrow when we're hopefully back to normal programming.